really, ultimately, standards are recipe books for complex mm -hmm. um, technical tasks and often tasks that occur um, between, mm -hmm. you know, um, between parties. And so the reason why standards have value is that uh, what you don't want to do is one-off integrations. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine you want to integrate with an app. Yep. You write a, a, cust a, you know, a snowflake piece of code, and then you get to the next one, you have to write another piece of code, and you get to the next one. And so, and what happens is your resources just get siphoned into yes. nothing. Whereas if you can write one time and enable every single partner you have mm -hmm. to connect with you in, in whatever way you need to connect, then all of a sudden you've, you, your investment creates a very, very scalable pattern. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Carson. I'm the Chief Security Scientist at Linea, and I'm really excited to welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Tonight podcast. And today, I'm really excited to have Pamela with me today, um, who is going to be talking about identity. So, Pamela, welcome to the show. Tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do, and some of the fun things you, you get excited about. Excellent. Well, hi, everybody. Yes, my name is Pamela Dingle, and I am the Director of Identity Standards at Microsoft. And what that means is I work with uh, an incredible team that gets to negotiate all of the um, all of the ways in which the industry connects identity systems together. We'll put oh, it that way. Okay. Uh, so those are identity standards, and um, it's a it's a fun and challenging job that lets us talk both internally with all of our engineers and externally to all these brilliant people in other companies around the globe. Fantastic. And so tell, how, how, how did you get into identity? What was your journey? What was the background? Can I, what, what, can I, oh, yes. Is this something that you wanted to start your career off or is this something that you kind of like segued into? Uh, the, yeah, this is my origin story. <laughs> uh, I didn't know anything about identity and uh, I started off in system administration. So I was okay. running uh, Spark workstations oh, so for insane. geophysicists <laughs> in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So hello to all Canadians. Um, <laughs> But uh, I actually started in identity because I went to a conference, ah. not dissimilarly to where we are now. Mm -hmm. I went to a, a conference that was then called the Burton Group Catalyst Conference. Okay. Now this was, I think, 2001. <laughs> and so I got there and my eyes were the size of dinner plates and I was okay. just blown Exciting. away <laughs> by all the amazing things happening. But it was an identity conference. And um, what I realized was you know, there were really important things getting mm. discussed and I got really excited about it. And I, you know, the reason I am where I am now in some ways is because, you know, I got excited about it and I started asking questions. Okay. And so I was that person who put their hand up at the end of the talk and asked the, the question at the end of the talk and uh, did it consistently. Mm. And uh, what happened was people started to notice that mm. I was, you know, both asking questions and asking reasonable questions mm. And uh, I ended up building an interesting network of people okay. just from those conferences and getting very, very excited about it. And in 2000, that was like pretty much, I think it was almost the start of the Jericho Forum at the time as well. So that's an interesting time to be getting into identity, especially when it was really a fundamental foundation that was being established at that point. Time. It really was. And in fact, the, the thing that really uh, made an impression on me at the time was that uh, Microsoft had announced a thing called, that was internally called Project Hailstorm, <laughs> Hailstorm. Um, also known as uh, Microsoft Passport. And uh, I did not work for Microsoft at the time. Uh, you know, I worked mm -hmm. uh, for someone else. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that I do work for Microsoft now. Okay. But at the time, I mean, I was just, you know, a, a fly on the wall watching as the industry really uh, reacted poorly yeah. to the introduction was, of that technology. They, but it was kind of really, it was finding itself. It was kind of, you know, you can't all of a sudden, when you're starting a, a new path, because... I think in the early 2000s, that's really where identity started kind of really kind of finding its footprint and finding its, you know, how it can change industry and how it can change even government's interaction with citizens. I think, of course, you had to start somewhere. It may have not been a great start and also adoption. I mean, it's not dissimilar. I'm based in Estonia and, of course, Finland were the first to try and do an identity program back even 1999 right. or 98. Right. And Estonia thought, well, we'll try it, but we'll try it in a little bit different way. Finland wasn't so successful with their, their implementation, but Estonia was. Mm -hmm. So you, you do have to do the trial and error. You do have to find what works, and sometimes you have to experiment. So, um, but who was some of your like, this is, who was some of your idols along the way? Who was the people that you looked up to that were kind of some of these finding kind of you know in the industry? Oh yeah, there were so many amazing folks. Uh, so 
Kim Cameron. Yeah, Kim Cameron, of, of course. course. Absolutely. Uh, if anyone wants to learn about the works of Kim Cameron, he wrote The Seven Laws of Identity, mm -hmm. which really was a game changer. And part of it came from mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft pivoting based on, on reaction, you know, to, uh, to their original announcement. And so The Seven Laws of Identity are, you know, epic. Uh, Bob Blakely, uh, you know, a lot of the catalyst analysts, uh, sorry, the Burton Group analysts at the time, uh, Ian Glazer. Mm -hmm. um, let's so, see. Ian's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Jamie, Jamie Lewis, mm -hmm. who ran the Burton Group at the time. I mean, all of these were um, epic thought leaders and just um, very calmly helping people understand that the best practices mattered and that the rigor mattered, right? Absolutely. And you're right, we, you know, before 2001, really, uh, when you think about what was happening before 2001, you know, identity was essentially directories. Yeah. Right. It was, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a phone book. <laughs> yeah. And directories <laughs> were a huge uh, improvement yeah. over databases mm -hmm. because they had this hierarchical model and they were person centric. Yes. And so, and they also focused on authentication. And then, so, you know, an LDAP bind yep. was a huge revelation at that time. And then 2001 uh, was really the time where people were starting to realize that their perimeters. Mm -hmm weren't enough and that they wanted to do business outside of their perimeters and they needed to be able to introduce people across boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the world that, um, you know, the passport yes. catalyst went into and that, and certainly um, the Jericho forum stuff was a big, big thing there, but also the Liberty Alliance was formed. And I'm told I wasn't there. So this is secondhand knowledge. So please nobody <laughs> get mad at me if I've got it wrong. But um, you know, my understanding in a lot of ways is that, Liberty Alliance was all about saying, well, what do we want? Mm -hmm. You know, what, uh, you know, we want, we know we want an, a world of identity where uh, domains can have, you know, can have control, mm -hmm. right? Where we can control identity, you know, where we can have sharing of identity, mm -hmm. but with rules that yes. both sides can participate in, yeah. right? And that's where we got the SAML 1.0 standard mm -hmm. that turned into the SAML 2.0 standard. <laughs> and that standard is still used today. Yeah. So I, th I do think, you know, 2001 was a pivotal time because even that was probably what I remember. I, I went to Sony in 2003 and when I went to Sony, they had just started their identity journey as well from a digital society. So for right. me, I think that was a kind of really foundation um, of really kind of realizing that we need a way to do identity verification, digital signature. We need to be able to authenticate, provide authorization. And really get to make sure that, you know, everything is somewhat having a, a root of trust at a source and, and verification and transparency and also non-repudiation. So what kind of, along the way, what things have you think have been important kind of, let's say, uh, moments in the time where identity has really evolved? Well, I will say that, my, you know, my experience is primarily in enterprise identity, yeah. which is, I think, different than even in, in what Estonia, you've done yeah, in, yes. in governmental yeah. identity or government to citizen, mm -hmm. they might call it. Um, but certainly in, in enterprise identity, there was this definite progression that occurred, right? So directories solved the problem of password proliferation, mm. right? It didn't solve the problem of how many times you had to type a password. Correct. It solved the problem of which password you typed. And so you would type the same password, but now you would mm. type it at every application everywhere you went because password uh, forms had not mm. gone away. Only, only the backend database that you checked had now centralized, yes. right? So that was step one. The next step was something uh, called WAM, Okay. or web access management. <laughs> and what web access management did was solve the how many times you type your password mm -hmm. problem. Yep. And they did that by having a, a session cookie, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And by placing generally, usually agents at every application that could mm -hmm. check that session cookie so yep. that you could log in once to a home realm. Mm -hmm. And then you could travel to all these applications and the applications would know who you are because of this, yep. um, this token. Um, session token. And of course, eventually it became an encrypted session token, which is very good. <laughs> which is a good, it's a good move. <laughs> yes, it turns out it was necessary. Um, and then, so so that, that was the web access management. And, uh, you know, there was a point in time, I want to say around 2006, mm -hmm. where, you know, it was smooth sailing. Everyone mm -hmm. was happy, except the problem was, that, of course, that cookies, right? That cookies have domains, yes. right? Associated to them. And uh, so you then ran into, actually, yeah, it was before, would have been before 2006. So, mm -hmm. so then, you know, everything that had been cooking mm -hmm. in, the, in the Liberty Alliance uh, and in you know, Oasis, which is the standards body where SAML was created, sort of came to the fore right around 2006, mm -hmm. where now this concept of federation yes. came out, right? And, and be, you know, because um, WAMs couldn't get you across 
those domain boundaries, mm -hmm. the Federation had its chance, right? Um, and so all of a sudden you would end up in, in enterprise having a web access management system for your, you know, your, your, domain and your soft yeah, chewy yeah, center yeah. with your hard perimeter. Mm -hmm. And then you would run your Federation server only to make hops across into other domains. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what at the time people were doing was um, it was a lot about contractors and a lot about third party suppliers, temp free employees. That's right. That's yes. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So that was sort of the age of Federation, um, and which has continued. And even it was the time, it was like BYOD was also kind of where people were beginning to own devices in yep. and, and still wanted to have access to corporate services. And that was, you know, it was almost considered like a contractor device in the right. scenario, but it was still an employee who was using their own personal yep. equipment. Yep. And that was also sort of the Web 2.0, right? Yeah. When Web 2.0 came out. Um, and then, and so that's why single sign-on worked so well mm -hmm. was, you know, the, the SAML profile was all about web redirects mm -hmm. and that worked great until it didn't. <laughs> and, you know, the point where it didn't was really at the point where cloud platforms and native applications accessing mm -hmm. APIs came out. Yes. Right. And that, those are the, you know, the glory days of Twitter, really, mm -hmm. where uh, you, you know, wanted application uh, inter integrations. So, you know, rather than having to, you know, import and export data, you want to have that natural data exchange. That's right. Exactly. And at the time, I don't know if you remember this, yeah. but uh, what happened was the way that people would originally try to call APIs was to take your username and your password, base64 encode it, and then include it on every single API, API fetch that you yes. made and this still happens today it still happens today it's actually if you go to bug bounties it's still quite a common problem oh, that we actually find all the time that's really <laughs> distressing but i'm not surprised um but at the time what was happening was that you know twitter was you know quite revolutionary yes. in its time and it also had this third party um model right mm -hmm. app model where apps yep. where you could have a proliferation of apps in the smartphone app stores mm -hmm. and smartphones are pretty new at that time and the, what was happening was those apps would just ask people for their usernames mm -hmm. and passwords because that was the only way that, that they were able way. to access the APIs. And so, yeah. so the, the, there was something called the password anti-pattern that mm -hmm. developed, which was basically users were being trained to enter a username and password for a service for anything that asks for it, right? Mm -hmm. there was, and, the re, and it became the password reuse, which, That's right. yeah, which Again, then you end up with one compromise means that you all all the other accounts that you had had to go through this password ro rotation and reset. Right. So. Right. Exactly. And so, uh, so there, you know, there was a very strong uh, pressure to find a solution for that, mm -hmm. and that's really where OAuth was born. Yes. Was you know not in the enterprise world at that time. It was really in the this cons new emerging mm -hmm. consumer cloud platform market. And so uh, OAuth one dot two, and then one dot. Uh, sorry, OAuth 1.0 and then 1.0a, because <laughs> they found a flaw, um, you know, came out, um, but was really for consumer use. Mm -hmm. And then the pressure came from enterprise to do the same thing, because now the enterprises wanted to have their own platforms. Absolutely. And it's the same time that we were actually doing a lot of cloud migration as well and using SaaS applications. Yeah. And it became important to make sure that you didn't have people having to have like multiple accounts everywhere. Right. That's exactly it. Exactly. And cloud, you know, it was cloud, cloud, yeah. cloud. <laughs> You know, you didn't have to say what cloud was. You just had to say cloud, <laughs> yeah. right? And, you know, this is my test, by the way. My test for how real something is, is, is uh, if, if, you, if somebody says a buzzword mm -hmm. and you say, what about that buzzword is important and they can't answer you, then it's yeah. not mature yet. Yeah, absolutely. For, for me, I always <laughs> laugh is because, you know, that assumption that cloud is like something magical. Right. <laughs> we just have to realize it's another computer in another place um, that you might not have access to or not have ownership right. or, or, or visibility over. Right. I mean, I think I think the the buzzword of the day at this point, at least in my world, is uh, ZKP or zero knowledge okay, proofs. Sure. Okay. They're real. Like you know, don't get me wrong. They're real. It's just that most people want them without knowing okay. what they you know exactly why they want them. They they just know it's good, but they don't know why it's good. <laughs> so. <laughs> so so let's fast forward to to today. Um, kind of, there's a lot of things happening around identity today. And I really like it because, you know, even though, you know, here at an RSA security conference, I was just saying is I really enjoy going to identity conferences because it's less scary. Yeah. <laughs> because here you get the fear of the scary part. Uh, but when you go to identity, it's more about enabling and integration and um, making it easy to get services right. and making the experience much better. So I always enjoy sometimes jumping out of the security and going into the identity as, as that side. But what's really happening? What's exciting today? I mean, we've heard a lot about 
I mean, I, from my view, I've had a lot of discussion around things like passwordless, and I think sometimes mm -hmm. the context gets lost in passwordless because it's more about a passwordless experience. Um, yes. There's still a secret somewhere that's being exchanged. Yes. So I will say, I think I, I've got to using passwordless experience as the proper term because um, for the user, that's experience is moving it more into the background and when the exchange happens. So what other things, you know, passwordless, what other things are exciting that you're, you know, seeing in the industry that's really evolving today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the focus on secrets mm -hmm. yep. is um, the great thing about it is it's moving beyond just users. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so in the enterprise world, again, you, you know, this concept of secrets management. Yes. It's very funny because we've always had secrets. We've always had many secrets. But what we've never had is a rigorous process applied to how mm -hmm. they get managed. There's never been expectations mm -hmm. necessary. Provisioned, migrated. Right. Uh, so the whole idea yeah. of the life cycle and of that life cycle being tracked centrally, mm -hmm. right? And of risk detection occurring upon all of these things. Like all of that, that's a sort of a new pioneering mm -hmm. um, land, right? And that's so much a case of identity and security colliding. Yep. I mean, that is just so much of what's happening right now is identity and security it's colliding. Like, yeah, it's the convergence. And it's also, you still have to think, I mean, what we don't want to get into is bring it all in together and merging it too much because right. you end up just having a complex big problem. I, I like to, because I learned years ago, it was one of the things that um, in Estonia I learned that they, they had the mentality of having not, at the time it was all, we were talking about software defined networks mm -hmm. and they're like, no, 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 no. It's about service defined networks. It's all about services. And that would made the realizing that you had to go through and have microservices along the way and make sure you have that segregation of duties. So when you get into, for example, single sign-on and then separating, making sure you have the continuous verification, whether it being multi-factor or two-factor, whatever type yep. of additional controls for security, then you've got the authentication side, then you have the authorization side. So it's always important for me is to make sure that you at least have some control and let's say uh, independence across all of those. Um, is that something you kind know, of you're seeing, you know, the convergence happening across both the security and identity that's bringing those more together? It is. I mean, the other one, is, the other one, you know, could you talk about buzzwords, right? Yeah. The other big interesting one right now is multi-cloud. Okay, yes. Where, <laughs> uh, you know, you're not only now managing resources in one cloud, you're mm -hmm. managing resources in two clouds. And frankly, you were probably already managing on-premises yeah. resources also, right? So mm -hmm. all of a sudden you have this set of, you know, maybe as many mm -hmm. as four, maybe even more environments, and you're trying to manage resources across them. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, you know, permissions management yes. becomes important. And, you know, we've had role, lots of role management mm -hmm. stuff occur before, but now it's really uh, moved much more into the, the infrastructure as a service mm -hmm. side of the house, right? So at, at you as an identity professional mm -hmm. are now starting to look at all those resource types and trying to yes. apply policy consistently across all of them. So it's a big job, but the industry is pivoting to help make it possible. Yeah. Um, the other one that's definitely less in the security world, I mean, because I know you probably talk about, for example, passwordless all the time. Yeah. Um, the other big one is on the governance side. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, you know, it's one of the favorite analyst um, cautions right now is around orchestration. Yes. So how do you, how do you take your workflows and make them intuitive, not only for the people who are running them mm -hmm. or who are using them, but for the administrators that are trying to implement them, okay, right? Which has a security angle because if you can't understand how your workflows work, that's when, you know, there are cracks that can, can happen, right? So understanding sort of what is your life cycle of getting a user into an org? Mm -hmm. What is your life cycle of having that user escalate privilege, yep. right? All of those things are getting much more baked and much more, um, there's a lot of um, time and energy going into making them easy, but also making them auditable, okay. right? And running d risk detection, all yep. of that. And especially across that multiple clouds as well, because exactly. that's where the challenge, if, you, if, you're, if you're not having some type of uh, uh, auditability across them, you end up having to keep going into each system individually and try yeah. to find what's happening. Right, and the attackers just find, they find the dark spots. Yeah, the ones that you were not looking, you know. That's right. The ones that you miss are, especially a lot of organizations who are doing digital transformation or moving to cloud, they try to retrofit what they have on-premise and push it to the cloud, and they end up realizing that they have some security by default or not enabled by default, right. misconfigurations, which ends up exposing them uh, significantly. So you're working in standards. How in, like how important is standards today? Um, like, I mean, and how, how long is the process to get a standard? Because I, I, I've, I've seen a lot of the, you know, I think years ago we've been talking about some of the standards and 
And I think today we're still talking about some of the standards as well. So what's the process and what's involved and, and, and why is standards important? So I think standards are more important than they have ever been because we are more connected to our world, you know, from a um, computer to mm -hmm. computer perspective than we ever have been. Um, when, when I talk about standards, I'm really talking about uh, interfaces that anyone can use mm -hmm. that, are, that operate in a predictable fashion. So you can imagine, you know, if, if you want to decide you want to go make blueberry muffins, you probably mm -hmm. don't try to create your first blueberry like muffin from version. scratch, right? <laughs> well, <that's only> <laughs> well, and you might, right? You might, through trial and error mm -hmm. and, and great time, you might come up with your own recipe, but mm -hmm. many, many people just go to a recipe book, right? Yes. And really, ultimately, standards are recipe books for complex mm -hmm. um, technical tasks and often tasks that occur um, between you know, uh, between parties. And so the reason why standards have value is that uh, what you don't want to do is one-off integrations. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine you want to integrate with an app, yep. you write a, a custom, you know, a snowflake piece of code, and then you get to the next one, you have to write another piece of code and you get to the next one. And so, and what happens is your resources just get siphoned into yes. nothing. Whereas if you can write one time, and enable every single partner you have mm -hmm. to connect with you in, in whatever way you need to connect, then all of a sudden you've, you, your investment creates a very, very scalable pattern. Yep. And so that's really what we do is we create the patterns for things that are very common. You know, the amazing thing about identity is everyone has to manage identities. Yes. And so it's easy for us to recognize that the things that are in common between all of our different organizations. And so examples of standards, um, we were talking before about single sign-on. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect example. Yep. People need to get introduced across domains, right? Um, whether you're going to a SaaS app or to another cloud platform. And so that's, you know, SAML is a secure introduction. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. Um, if you look at something like SKIM, mm -hmm. which is System yes. for Cross-Domain Identity Management, it's about the fact that um, everyone needs to call user APIs, right? Like, you know, get me the user's name, get me the user's uh, username and login, mm -hmm. get me attributes uh, about the, the user. Uh, the, the objects and resources that they have, yeah. Right, and you need to be able to push mm -hmm. users into systems, you need to pull users out mm -hmm. of systems and synchronize the data between systems so that you don't have data diverging because a lot of that data becomes part of a security decision. Oh, yeah. And so, so that's another example of a pattern. Uh, Skim is just a standardized yeah. um, user. It helps to do deduplication as well from actually having to have like, you know, records in multiple places. It does, yeah, exactly. Um, it, you know, it creates a relationship between the two companies so that, you know, you get a, you get a ripple effect yep. um, in case a uh, user is removed, for example, or data changes. So, uh, and it, of course, increases accuracy. So in the old days, you, yeah. you know, especially if you're a female, you got married and you changed your name in one system and it stayed it's changed in that in the system. system. Yeah, even, I've seen people like, you know, moving between states or like changing addresses and having car registration all of a sudden. Trying to maintain all of that just becomes a, a kind of administrative nightmare. Right. And I love, actually, one of the things that's what I loved about Estonian model was always that, you know, that data lake model where you've got data repositories in different areas. And what you do is you provide read access between each of them. So... Therefore, you don't duplicate the data if it's in one location already. You just you tell it the metadata location of how to find it. And therefore, you can get accuracy. You have one place to keep it updated and maintained. And therefore, it just meant maintenance of it becomes so much easier. Right. Makes sense. And then I think the other really big trend is decentralization in identity. And, you know, there's obviously a consumer angle to that and a government angle and an enterprise angle. But generally speaking, the, the whole idea behind it is uh, if, it, you know, identity these days is mostly accomplished, mm -hmm. at least securing messages is accomplished through asymmetric cryptography. Yep. And so the question becomes, you know, today, most systems create an account on behalf of a user. Yes. And, and the companies control how you authenticate. They control, you know, whether you're, uh, you know, alive or dead in the system, so to yeah. speak, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of decentralized identity is what if, the user controlled that piece. This is the conversation I have with Paul Simmons for a long time. <laughs> so, yes. so we had we had that discussion about that, and this this got me thinking after the after that conversation. I mean, I think it was going back maybe about five six years ago. We were actually here at RSA, and I remember having the conversation over dinner or like we were with drinks at a party, and I was talking about the Estonian system, and he was talking about decentralized, of course, with the Jericho form and everything, and he got me realizing. That at that time, I started thinking about the, if we do decentralize identity and the user is the best person at bringing who they are, then it becomes that important part of the root of trust of how well, do we have mutual trust 
through as I'm first time getting introduced, there's a way for me to show that we have a mutual party that can verify that I'm really right. who I am. And then that started me thinking about at that time, it was about 2016, about bring your own identity. And you get into that scenario about, and this is this conversation myself and Martin had recently, just an updated version of my my thoughts in this, that you get into, well, if the user brings their own identity, that means you really, all the organization does is need to really provide enablement and access and give them the permissions they need to. So is this something, you know, is that where decentralized identity is going, um, that scenario, or are we still a bit early in the phase? Oh, I think that's exactly where it's going. Uh, we're, we're, I would say we're mid-phase. Mm -hmm. um, in that we now have the, the standards are mostly baked now to be able to send credentials around. So I guess this is the other piece is part of decentralized identity is something called verifiable credentials. Yes. And verifiable credentials are, um, you know, very similar to something like a SAML mm -hmm. assertion. It is an assertion. It's a signed document. Um, but, but the difference um, about a verifiable credential and something like a single sign-on assertion is that the verifiable cred credential is meant to be held by the subject mm -hmm. of the credential. Yes. And so credentials, you know, just like a regular wallet, cred credential gets issued to you and then you control it. You control when, uh, you know, as the end user, you control when you present that, that assertion. And so that three-party model of, mm -hmm. of uh, they call it holder, subject, and, uh, and issuer, or holder, mm -hmm. yeah. verifier, and issuer, um, changes the game. Mm -hmm. Because what it can do is it can allow you to suddenly present a credential that no longer is about establishing who you are, but what you can do. Yeah, and uh, this gets into even the question. So after, I remember later, after having that discussion with Paul, myself and Ian had a discussion. So Ian Glazer, we were talking about, we were talking about the same thing. And I was like, curious to what his thoughts was. And it was into where you don't need even the data anymore. You just need to have the right question to ask. Right. So are you old enough to drive? Yes, and that's the only answer you need, and you need to know, verify that this is uh, valid data. Are you able to stay in a hotel? Um, are you able to, to, to drink? Are you able to vote? You need to have the right questions. You don't necessarily need to look at someone's ID to get those questions. You need to have a source of asking those questions. Right, and you have to trust mm. Uh, who the person who, who, making the statement. Yes, or, or have a mutual trust that actually can say that this data is correct. Right. And, uh, you know, in the case of, when you think about foundational documents like driver's license, um, there, you know, mo native mobile, native digital driver's licenses are a thing and they're coming. Yeah. And, uh, it, of course, it matters. <laughs> it really matters who says you can drive. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You, 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 want, you want to make sure that it's coming from a very trustable source. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Um, you know, as soon as the lawyers get involved, that's, yep. you know, as, as soon as somebody's going to sue someone else, then uh, it really matters. Yep. Um, and you have to be able to prove it. Yep. So. And is this where, so, you know, I remember even recently where we've now got many different identity providers now in Estonia. We used to be like one or two. And now we've got tons of identity providers. And mm -hmm. depending on what level you come in, you've got different levels of security assurance level, depending on kind of how trustworthy they are. And now it's moved into, where all of this is now moving into a digital wallet. So... Do you think the digital wallet is now going to be the kind of central place of data, you know, let's say like a, a data proxy or data exchange? Is that where? Yes. And it's becoming transactional as well. Because when you look at current digital wallets, they're very static. Um, but I think it's really important that they do move to more transactional model and they stay updated. Yes. And I, I mean, the, the amount of opportunity mm -hmm. that a digital wallet represents is unbelievable. Because what it can actually be is your your trusted assistant. It can be the entity that's looking across all of your credentials and saying, if you, if you pass this credential, you're going to create a, a correlation risk, mm -hmm. right? Or if you, you know, or you have already given this other credential to your website. Are you sure you want to do that, right? Because now, because you're in the center as the user, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you can check across all of the websites you go to. You're, you actually have, you yourself can correlate your own data. Mm -hmm. Right, as much as you don't want anyone else to be correlating yeah. data, to have you be able to correlate it is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of really interesting things. There's a thing called consent receipts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I actually, if I've got, in, in the, there's a process in Estonia which was in the uh, loyalty cards. So where you end up, you can determine. Um, one is basically when you go through the payments and loyalty cards, you can determine, you know, is it personal or is it uh, tax, you know, tax deductible and so forth. So you can start actually starting to do consent and to determine whether I want to pass this already to the tax authority as, as you purchase the, the, the item. Nice, nice. Well, so consent receipts is very similar. Um, the, you know, imagine a case, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, the standard exists today, but there are very few implementations. Okay. 
but um, the potential is that every time, for example, you agree to a privacy policy at a mm-hmm. website, they send you a receipt of what you agreed to uh, so and when, right? So that if they violate it, you can go back and say, this was, this, this is was what a, I agreed it's to. It's con- almost like the contract that's there. Because right now, it's all of those are very vague and not very clear to ho- what you've done in the past. There's yep. no proper audit trail or transactional model. So I think that's, when I'm thinking about the, the digital wallet implementation and going into the transactional piece, you can actually have all of those consents maintained and right. verified and make sure they're actually, you know, being, being, been held accountable. Right. And you could, in the future, you could mm-hmm. negotiate them. Yep. I, I mean, you could so literally monetize, say. You could monetize them. <laughs> I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could. But so, that interaction's yeah. just never been possible before mm-hmm. because you've always been a captive member of every site yeah. you're at. And so, and they all think of it differently. They store it diff- differently. And all of a sudden, you know, there's this one central thing that can make it yeah, So better. I don't like my mind starting to get excited because I'm starting to think about, you know, how right. identity in the privacy side. And then, because I, I always think that, you know, that convergence, there's a bit of a, that privacy is starting to become more of a, a digital rights management scenario as well. So, you know, how you monetize it because other companies are monetizing it on your, like, without your consent. Right. And now it's important to have that visibility and start maybe, you know, uh, it becomes also, you know, extension of your, your, your income as right. well. Right. So, what, so what's, what's next? What do you think is going to be like, what's the, the big thing uh, for, for, you know, like for the audiences as a takeaway that you're going to see that's going to be the next big thing that's coming forward? There's so many big things. Well, <laughs> I, I actually do think that passwordless, mm-hmm. going back to passwordless, is going to be, the you know, is big change. and yeah. will fundamentally change. And part mm-hmm. of that is, uh, if you haven't seen the um, Apple WWDC presentation uh, uh, on past, I, I haven't seen the presentation. I've read some of the summaries. Um, yeah. So, because I do, it's I still think you know the password experience. What it is doing is that fundamental secret, and you get into temporary secrets and temporary keys. And um, I had a, a recent episode with uh, uh, Dustin Hayward, uh, Evil Mog, who's the you know password cracking uh, at Xforce Red Team. Um, and we had the conversation that was exactly that that scenario where you really, you know, you're putting it all in the background. It becomes, the, always the still challenge is the provisioning piece and how you mm-hmm. migrate devices is always going to be kind of the, yes. the risk. Account recovery yeah. is. Uh, yes. But this is, so this is mm-hmm. the sort of the real significance of the Apple announcement. Um, Passkey is a slight uh, different implementation mm-hmm. from your standard FIDO security key um, or Windows hello yep. type of implementation where they are actually allow, allowing the private key to roam. Okay. So that's, it's a big deal, right? It, it is a big deal because that's where, that's the, that becomes a risk. Is it does. That if it becomes, um, and then, you know, you get into, well, what's the root? What, what's the, what's the parent? Um, what's the, what was the, where was it created? Are we going to create a chain of trust? Are they going to be derivatives of that private key? Or is it going right. to be just duplication of the same key in multiple places? That's, that gets a bit scary for yes. me. When yes, I, when I know. I, and all, all, <laughs> I'm all of us are like, eh. <laughs> on the other hand, right, mm-hmm. we have password managers today, which have taken us, you know, a, a huge step forward mm-hmm. in security. And, uh, you know, our passwords are stored in a password manager that is synced to our consumer yeah. world. And so this is basically the same idea. The idea that, uh, you know, your iOS passkey Yes. Right. That key would be available on any device mm-hmm. that you own. Right. And so now you can lose your device and not and, lose access. And not lose access. So because we know. this because <laughs> it's, it's going back to the same discussion I had with the Estonian government. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> we had the issue back in 2015 where the weakness in the uh, encryption and ultimately it meant that it was about 800 and something thousand cards. Right. And there was the discussion that time because your ID card in Estonia was the parent and your SIM card or eSIM or the, you know, the card in your phone was a child. You would mm-hmm. actually, you know, use your parent to sign that. And they get into the discussion because of that issue about actually, well, let's make this one also equivalent. Let's duplicate it. Right. And I got into, I was like, are we sure we want to go that path? Because that, it, it creates a management challenge. Yes. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, also the security concerns, but it does create a management nightmare. But what is, you know, where is that pyramid anymore? Because now we're moving into a, a, a rectangle and now we have multiple of those. Yes. So Yes. And it's a very different calculation for enterprise than yeah. for consumer, mm-hmm. right? Um, but the consumer problem is a huge problem. Yes. And, you know, I the, the question is, if we don't do something, 
um, you know, if we if we keep these keys heavily bound to hardware for consumer use, yes. then are we just creating technology that no one's ever going to adopt? Right. So, uh, yeah. you know, the, the I thing think so. about yeah, it's, it's it's that's the challenge. We want to make it usable. We want to make people be able to easily pick up another device and just continue where they left off. Right. And if we can if we can actually move people mm -hmm. away from passwords, I mean, that's the trade off. Yes. If we can get a hundred percent penetration, mm -hmm. because we literally make it easier for someone to pick up their smartphone you know, use their biometric and gain access to any website on the web, then we have moved the ball in a, in a very meaningful way. Yeah. And then we can always tune what mm -hmm. happens after that. We can tighten it. Yeah. We can address fraud. So this means that you know, everyone's going to have to have a password manager. <laughs> I, you know, it's going to be, yeah. I, <laughs> if you want to securely sync that across multiple devices, you're going to have the, have the way to securely transfer it. And, right. And, and right it, now so. it's just the cloud platforms yeah. are going to take care of it. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't mean it'll, I mean, it's a very... Um, I think once people really see the potential mm. to have every single person out there be able to use pass keys yep. instead of passwords, then uh, who knows yep. what will happen. But it's really important to note that the high assurance use cases are not going away. So um, they're, you know, the standard is not um, changing. It's not loosening, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's enveloping this, this secondary use case, but you can still drive your cred credential down to hardware if yep. you choose to. And device-bound keys uh, are still part of the specification. Which, which has been the whole evolution in eSIMs and being able to kind of have multiple, you know, devices that people have and, and to be able to use any one as the same thing. So Right, exactly. So this has been fantastic. I, would, I, I know, could go on so for, I literally could go on for <laughs> hours on this topic. So uh, for the audience, I mean, this, I think for a lot of our listeners, this is going to be so exciting to really get to better understand identity, the history, about you and kind of your ideas. And I think the future is, for me, it's, I love these types of conversations because just be kind of like, I've got my ideas going. Uh, so again, many thanks for joining the show and the episode. Um, this is going to be so much fun. The audience is going to learn a lot about identity and where it's came from and where it's going. Um, so any final comments or words that you would like to, to share with the audience? No, only turn on NMFA. But I suspect <laughs> yeah. anyone who's listening to your podcast already knows that. So. Um, they, they know it, but um, I'm hoping that they have done it. I, there's no way of me knowing that they put it in place. That's but right. uh, definitely multi-factor authentication. Um, don't let passwords be the only thing that's keeping you safe. Yes. And, you know, if you can't turn it on for everyone, protect your admins. Yeah. Step one, protect your admins. Absolutely. So again, many thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, Pamela Dingle, who is an awesome uh, identity knowledge that we've had in the show. So uh, stay safe. Tune in every two weeks for the 401 Access Tonight podcast. I'm your host for the episode, Joe Carson. Again, many thanks for joining us and stay safe and have fun. Take care. Bye.